And welcome back, everyone, to another Pivot Podcast. So glad you could join us. Once again, I'm joined with my amazing co-host, Mr. Dan Jansen. How are you, sir? I'm doing awesome, especially because of our guest today. Oh, yeah. we got Robert Falco, <laughs> the doctor in the house. So uh, let's introduce Dr. Falco. How are you? I'm good, Dan. Tracy, how are you both? We're recording this on the uh, the three-day weekend for President's Day, so everyone's feeling refreshed. It's going to be like one of the only episodes we record that the market hasn't been open all day. So we'll see. We'll see. But it's a good time to kind of prepare for things. Good time to to look out as we're pretty knee deep into earnings season, probably on the tail end of it now. But um, there's always another one. There's always another earnings season coming up. So we had to bring in Falco uh, just as, as we go through a lot of the earnings uh, reports as they come out. We go through them live. We'll do some videos on some of the things. But there's there's ways to play the earnings, correct? There's there's traders that, that will actually play uh, pre and post earnings. Is that correct? That's correct. You can do it uh, either way beforehand and, uh, you know, roll the dice or afterwards and catch the aftermath, which this earnings season, there has been some straight up aftermath. So it's been exciting. There's been some doozies for sure. Yeah. Well, what do you, what do you, out of the two, which do you prefer? Do you like playing it prior to earnings or are you more of a after earnings, let's not gamble type situation? Uh, generally, I prefer to play them after uh, with any type of you know size or anything like that. However, there are some earnings strategies that I do like to use on companies going into earnings. There's a couple different ones. So it really just depends on the overall setup. Um, usually like the first few earnings reports for the season, I don't do a whole lot. And I want to see how does the market react to some of the different companies that are reporting earnings. And, you know, for example, like all the growth stocks, I've just been getting murdered. So it's like Roku going into earnings because every other growth stock has gotten killed. Like the likelihood is that Roku, no matter how good they do, they're probably going to get hammered as well. Or like Teladoc coming up in a couple of days is probably going to get hammered also. So I'll usually watch to see how does the market respond to the first few, maybe like week or so. And then I'll look to play some setups if they're out there. Gotcha. What's your favorite? Before, after, during, and also actually before you answer that, I did want to ask you, some of your uh, targets can get hit during the actual pre-market or post-market. Can you explain a little bit about how to do that and some of the limitations that might be in place when you do that? Uh, yeah, so for day trading, obviously playing afterwards and then sometimes swing is, is really nice. Uh, but from an option selling standpoint, most of the time, outside of like this earning season, Option selling is, is the way that I really want to go because the market makers in general do a really good job pricing in expected moves. Otherwise, they wouldn't be market makers if they were just constantly losing tons and tons of money. So generally, I try to go with the market makers and uh, sell like one and a half times outside of the expected range. And then, yeah, you can trade after hours for thinkorswim it's gtc ext you have to make sure that your orders are uh, in there and it's only limit orders there's no like market orders there's no stop limits that kind of thing on interactive brokers it's fill outside rth so fill outside of regular trading hours you can use stops but you have to use stop limits so if you are going to trade um let's say something bullish and you have a stop underneath if it, if it goes against you in the after hours you need to make sure that your stop and your stop limit are pretty far apart because number one, the market's pretty thin, so there can be really big spreads. And if you have a stop and a stop limit or a stop and a limit that are very close to each other, you can just plunge right through it and not fill. So you really want to make sure that you're giving yourself a, a good amount of space between that stop and that limit order if you are using those um, on something like interactive brokers after hours. Okay. Perfect. Gotcha. Do you, do you plan, like how far in advance of earnings do you plan your trades out? Is it usually, uh, so usually, usually the day look, before or, or is there strategies that you'll use that's a few weeks out or something like that? Usually I look at the upcoming week and then I'll make like a note to myself. Okay. Just remember like Teladoc is on the 22nd. I think it is uh, for this coming week. So usually I'll plan out the week. And then if I'm selling, I like to sell like right before the market closes before earnings because I want to make sure that 
if I'm trying to play an expected range and let's say the expected range is $20 and the stock's at 200, well, then I know I got to be, uh, if I want to be outside that, I got to be outside 180 and outside 220. Um, whereas if I get into that position a couple days ahead of time, and it's 205 and then, you know, right before earnings, it's at 200. Well, now my downside is only 15 bucks away instead of uh, the 20 that the expected move is covering. So if I'm selling options, I usually do it right before. Uh, if I'm buying options, so like I bought some puts on Teladoc um, Thursday. Yeah, thurs Thursday during the day um, because I think either Roku had just gotten killed or was like in the process of getting killed. And uh, there was another one that was getting hammered. And so I bought puts on Teladoc, some kind of like lotto ticket puts uh, on Thursday. And then Friday, those puts were up over 100%. So I just sold half of them and just kept the other half. And it's like, Hey, I got a free, free roll into earnings coming up over the next couple days. So it really depends. But if I'm selling, I like to do like right before they report, usually like 10 minutes before market closes. Gotcha. Yeah, anytime you can play with house money going into it, earnings is probably a much better situation to be in. Just I, I've, I've had a yeah. couple of those Airbnb specifically where they jumped a hundred percent and it was a free roll into earnings. And then after earnings, they, they crushed it and, I was able to, to capitalize on a lot, but you don't know what happens when earnings come out. Like you could be as bullish as possible on a company and they just, for whatever reason, it doesn't even have to be the earnings. It could be market sentiment or just ran too, too fast into earnings, stuff like that. So you, no matter what the earnings are, you don't really know how the stock's going to re react. The one question I would have, cause you hear a lot of, even like people on TV, um, you, you said it a few times as far as expected, what their expected move is from earnings how would you go into find what those expected like how would how would a listener go into understand what that is yeah so the easiest way is to just look at the expiration for that particular week so like this coming week is going to be what the 20 26 or whatever it is on friday uh it's probably off by a day or two but i would look at options that expire that friday and then uh, in thinkorswim in the top right corner, it'll show you what the expected move is with a plus or minus, or you just add an at the money put and an at the money call. And that's what they're pricing in for the expected move. Because yeah, the market makers have to discount, like what do they think is gonna happen? And that has to be translated throughout the entire option chain. Otherwise you would have people just arbitraging uh, strikes against each other. And so they have to price it in right at the money. And then that goes through the entire option chain. So sometimes you can get things really far away. You can get premiums. So like iron condors um, are one of my favorites to sell because your direction neutral, it can go up or down, or if it just gaps sideways, you make money. It's easy to limit your risk. Uh, I try to go like one and a half deviations. So if the expected move is $20, I'll look at $30 and go outside of that range and see if there's still money there. That uh, gives me good risk reward. Now, do you and go from do there. you only trade options for earnings? Uh, not all the time. Sometimes I will do shares. So like Roku, which I should have bought options because the thing actually absolutely got hammered. But Roku was already down like 10%. And um, so by the time that we were coming into the close and it was reporting, yeah, I was reporting Thursday night. And so the puts were super pricey because it already dropped. I'm like, well, I think it's going to drop again, but I don't really know if I should buy these 120 puts because they were like five or six dollars. And then your break even, you know, it's like 114, 115 area. You're buying a put at 120. And so I just short sold a couple of shares going into the close. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'm pretty conservative, so I'll calculate. Like, let's say again, hey, it's it's a twenty dollar move, and I want to risk five hundred bucks. So maybe I'll I'll short twenty to twenty five shares, something like that, and then I will have a target like where I think it's going to to drop to, and I'll just put a limit out there because sometimes you get algorithmic uh, spikes one way or another on the headline, and then it'll you know fade the other way. So I have my target hanging out there, and then if it goes the other way, I'll just drag it up and you know close it out. I'm not trying to like hold it for the whole thing and roku was a funny one because their website was going down like their investor relations site was not refreshing and so the stock was barely moving it was moving down a little bit but not very much and it's like oh great they probably took it offline so that, that way the headline algos wouldn't you know be able to scan it and slam it off the uh right off the number but as soon as the website came back up 
it just plummeted again. Hmm. For for some of the longer term investors that might not touch the stocks they have, or for tax purposes might not want to sell sell shares they have, uh, and for numerous other reasons, is there a recommended way that you, not really I guess recommended, but is there a way that you would kind of hedge those certain positions that that they might have coming into an earnings for that company that they're holding? Uh, yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly. Like, if if you're gonna hold long term, eventually you have to hold over earnings. Otherwise, your idea of long term is like not even three months because they report earnings every quarter. So at some point, you have to hold over earnings. Now, different people have different um, risk tolerances and everything like that. So you know, I can't give like one piece of advice that would fit everyone because I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know everybody's individual. Uh, needs and goals and all that type of stuff. But if you're going to hold something long term, eventually you're going to have to hold over earnings. And there are times when it really makes sense to throw like a collar on. So you sell an out of the money call, use some or all of that money to buy a uh, near the money put or just outside of the money put to protect gains. So an example of that was not this last quarter, or I think CRM already reported. So not this one, but the one before that where it had the big gap down. I was in CRM probably like six or seven months. Uh, I think I was in around like 219 was my average and it was up at like 280 or so. And so I had a pretty good amount of profit, you know, baked into it. And so I sold an out of the money call, bought a near the money put, it still cost me a couple hundred bucks. I'm like, Hey, I'm up, you know, six, $7,000 on these shares. If I spend $200 net to protect myself over earnings, cause everything else had been gapping down anyways, it's probably worth it. Uh, the stock gap down massively. It retested a little bit and then rolled back over. And so I was able to just use that put to expire in the money and sold my shares up at 275 when the stock was at like 235, 240. And then I just sold a put until I actually got put shares again uh, this Friday back down at, you know, 210. So nice. That, that, that's what I'll usually yeah. do. Now, Vol like earnings brings me with it a lot of volatility, which is why a lot of people like to play earnings. Uh, how much experience do you think a trader has to have before they start really trading um, pre earnings or post earnings? Mm, I would say at least a couple of years because even if you t and still to this day, it doesn't mean like that I'm perfect at it or anything. Even if you told me exactly what the earnings were going to be beforehand like i couldn't tell you with 100 percent certainty like how the market would respond mm -hmm. to it especially nowadays when there's like head it's a headline driven market like it doesn't it doesn't matter what some of these companies report like if putin decides to invade the ukraine like the stock's gonna go down it doesn't matter mm -hmm. uh or like if it's just a heavy heavy selling day some of these companies it just it doesn't matter how good they report it's gonna get hammered or like snapchat was getting absolutely clobbered on facebook earnings so snapchat was down like 23 percent. they hadn't even reported yet so the bar was so low everyone was thinking they were just going to get absolutely hosed and they actually got over that bar a little bit and then it jumped all the way back up to where it was plus another like 10 percent. so it looked like it was like a 40 50 percent gap but really all it was was like back to where it was before plus a little bit more but anyone who was shorting ahead of time or buying puts when it was already down 20 percent just because the Facebook had Facebook results had killed the expectations and they got absolutely crushed. Mm -hmm. What are your um, kind of requirements and whether or not you'd play pre earnings or wait till post earnings? Yeah. So normally I like to see um, a, like a calm or a stable earnings season where, where things aren't gapping like massively because then I can, do my more favorite strategies, which is like sell, um, iron condors, or sometimes I'll do naked strangles, which I definitely don't advise unless you know how to hedge those after hours. But those are like really high probability. Uh, I like to win. So I'd rather win like a little bit of money with really high probability versus like risk, you know, a ton and flip coins for like 50, 50. Cause then it just seems like gambling to me. So usually I want to see like a stable earnings environment where things aren't gapping a ton. But that there's some good volatility, as you mentioned, priced in. So that way I can sell like outside of the expected move and still have um, a good amount of premium for whatever risk I'm putting on. So that's what I usually like to see. Or in markets like this, 
where it's gapping like crazy, then that's also good because then oftentimes you can make money with things like straddles, like buying a straddle or buying a strangle, which are normally just complete suckers bets. Uh, but an earnings season like this where things are gapping really, really big, you can make money doing that. So I like to either see very calm or like very wild earnings because then you can make money with a couple different strategies. And and that would force you into a pre pre earnings strategy versus waiting till earnings comes out and then playing it post. Most of the okay. time. Yeah. If it's something like, so like Shopify, the, the puts were just too expensive. Um, I, I didn't want to risk a, an IV crush mm -hmm. on, on Shopify. So I waited until after it gapped and then, uh, it was like such an easy short after the fact. So the earnings gap um, and the size of the gap gave me confidence the next day and the, the day after that to get in short on the thing. Whereas I didn't really want to do that pre because the, the options were just so pricey. Gotcha. Gotcha. Can you explain? So Sorry, Dan. Uh, can you explain what IV crush is? Because we've heard that before. And just for our newer traders out there so they understand that because there's a lot of risks that are associated with trading options and i think that's one of the ones that many people don't really fully understand and and they end up getting hurt by it yeah so an iv crush is just implied volatility um collapsing because what happens is if a stock normally moves let's say five dollars in a week well you're going to have that at the beginning of the week you're going to have an, an implied move of five dollars you know uh, 250 up or down mm -hmm. right to total five bucks. Well, when you have a, when you have a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a, a, a binary event. Like it's either going, they're either going to do well or they're not. You have this huge amount of uh, volatility and of like guessing basically going into that. And so it, instead of it normally moving $5, it's like, oh, well, it's going to move $20. And if it doesn't do that, so let's say it only moves five bucks, but they were pricing in 20 anyone who bought options just gets absolutely killed because right after earnings, it's like, okay, the binary event is over and now it's back to just what the normal volatility of the stock is versus this one big event. That's either going to be a huge positive or a negative or just a nothing burger for the stock. Gotcha. Yeah. And just a, a quick plug before we get to the next one. So you do have some mentor groups coming up. If people want to learn uh, some of the more, probably advanced option strategies that would be a good way for them to to learn because we're throwing out some some phrases and terms that some listeners might not be familiar with but uh the mentor group would definitely be good for that to just kind of be able to to see how it's done slowly in person and, and kind of get that explained but that being said you do teach a lot of mentor groups what are some of the what are some of the things that you find from from newer traders or traders, uh, maybe not even newer, just just newer at earnings, some of the mistakes that they make, some of the more common. Uh, so ones. number one mistake that people make over earnings is buying options. Um, like I said, normally it's it's more of a sucker's bet to buy options over earnings. There can be times where you can play like the run up into earnings. So like if you buy calls like a couple weeks out, if the stock um, starts to move up slowly but then you start to get all that volatility being priced in. Like you can sell them before earnings and make some money. Um, but outside of that, like the biggest thing is buying options and then it doesn't really gap very large and they just get crushed. So you got to think the market makers, like I mentioned earlier, they do this for a living. Like that's what they do. If they sucked at it, like they wouldn't be there. And so most of the time the market makers are going to be right in pricing in expected moves into the options. So like, even if you get a gap down, if you didn't get enough of a gap down or that gap down starts to fade immediately, like the, the option is just not going to be worth very much and you're going to lose money. And so that's the number one mistake I see. And then number two would be going in too heavy. So on something like, I don't know, let's say Roku, you know, if people are going in and they're buying like hundreds of shares before earnings, like they might do on like a day trade, uh, or even a swing trade, and then you get a huge gap. Uh, it doesn't really matter that you have a stop in there because the thing could just blast right through your stop with a really huge gap. So you really have to size down over earnings because the gaps can be really big uh, if, you know, like a market like we have right now, which is pretty wild. Right. If you were to give a strategy to a newer trader um, for them to kind of dip their feet into trading earnings, what would it be? 
Um, gosh. A newer trader, I would probably just say don't play earnings, like play the gap afterwards. I think that's easier. But if someone really wanted to play earnings, I would say just buy like one share. Buy one share and then see how it reacts over uh, earnings. And, you know, try to make like 10, 20 bucks or something like that on that share and sell it after hours. Um, that would probably be my number one, like the easiest thing for people to try um, because there's not a lot of risk with one share usually, uh, but they get to see that, hey, the the moves can be pretty substantial and they can have uh, really good follow through. And it is fun. I mean, I'm not gonna lie and say it's not fun, but uh, again, even with all of the like charting and everything else, like you just don't know. It's always a little bit of a coin flip of how the market's going to respond to earnings because the earnings could be good and the stock could still get it just completely crushed because like their guidance was bad or they did a bad job on the conference call like like peloton i mean it was like nothing but excuses and it was just absolutely awful uh or roku same thing you know the the roku ceos out there like like oh yeah they beat on maybe it was revenue or something like that and he said well, I don't really care about the stock price right now. I'm looking at the long term. yet he's literally never bought a share. All he's doing is just selling, 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 selling shares. So it's like, watch what they do, not what they say. So it doesn't really necessarily matter what they even report. There's other things that can happen that drive the direction one way or another. So that's why it's generally like for newer people, better to just not play it. But if they really want to just do it with like one share or five shares or something like that. Gotcha. And do you have a favorite strategy for after or like um, after the earnings have come out? So the, the next day. Uh, yeah. So day trading is one that um, that's obviously going to be really good because if you do have a big earnings gap. You can get a lot of people trapped. A lot of people like Shopify. It got below that. It had like a three week pennant. And I, I put a little um, chart out on my, um, my trading view ideas feed. I might've put it on Twitter too, but uh, I'm like, Hey, if Shopify gaps into this red box, like it's going to get absolutely hammered. It didn't quite get there. It closed in the red box. It didn't gap to it, but there was like three weeks of people trapped. And then the very next day it did almost the exact same thing that Facebook and PayPal did. And it's like, what happened to those? Well, they got killed. So it was like super, I don't want to say easy, but it, increase my confidence to take the day trade short because like it's doing the exact same thing that both of these other stocks did when they had huge gap downs hmm. very good but yeah it's typically typically easier once other companies do relatively the same thing because a lot of times when we're talking about well, especially to two newer traders and we've had a couple traders or i've had a couple of traders in my mentor groups that are just like it's just so hard for me to hit the button like i see the trade i see the order i just don't want to hit it the only way you could do that is build confidence. So one of the ways, especially when something is as volatile as earnings, yeah, I mean, if you can't, if you're having trouble pressing the button during live hours and you're worried about risk and just, I don't want to lose the money, I would definitely stay away from earnings 100%. Like just, it's it's like the, it's not really the wild west, but it, it could get crazy. But by seeing how earnings report, and I think that's a solid piece of advice that you gave as far as just buy one share, just because you're going to want to see the process of how those earnings based on how good the report was, how the stock was acting prior to those earnings, how bad the report was, and also what guidance was, how that how that stock has followed through or doesn't have followed through. So just by seeing that over and over again, you, you kind of understand like, okay, this is a position that I could take, or I've seen this happen before, like you said, with, with Spotify. So that just gives courage to people and, and kind of bravery and confidence in, in terms of how to get into the trade and why it should work and nothing has to happen. But if you see it over and over probabilities on your side. So I like that. What, what do you put more weight to? Do you put more weight to the actual earnings that come out or to the guidance? Uh, it depends on the market. So like right now it's all about guidance. Uh, no one cares what you did yesterday or last quarter. It's all about what are you going to do in the future? And then uh, the other thing that matters a lot especially if you're holding shares of something longer term and you have a lot of money invested in these companies, like you should be listening to the conference calls. Otherwise, like I think that people are just being, um, being like willy nilly with their money, I guess you would say, or just ignorant because they uh, have a lot of money invested in some of these companies. They don't listen to the conference calls are super important. So the other thing like right now that you're hearing every single CEO is complaining about the supply chain. 
So is the supply chain getting better or worse? Well, if every single CEO is still complaining about it, it's not getting any better. And so that doesn't give me a lot of confidence like going forward to buy any of these companies. So even if they try to say like, oh yeah, our guidance is going to be pretty good, but we have, you know, these continued supply chain issues and the more and more CEOs that are mentioning that, then it's just more likely that I'm going to lean bearish after um, some of these moves have shaken out a little bit. So listening to the conference calls is also really, really important that I think most people don't do. And you can listen like right on YouTube. Sometimes they broadcast them or like through their site. Um, most of the time you don't have to call in on a phone anymore. And a lot of times it's like 30, 45 minutes and you can get some really good information off the conference call. Perfect. Um, now, <laughs> I was going to, I was going to thank you first of all, cause I think we're just about out of time. So I want to thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, you do have, do you have a mentorship coming up soon? Uh, we actually, I'm in the process of one right now, so it probably won't be listed until like towards the end of March for okay. April. So it'll be a little. Okay, perfect. Well, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. Um, that's pretty much it. I really appreciate having you here. So it's, it's been great to, to pick your brain. You're definitely one of the leading guys that, that I know anyway, in, uh, when it comes to their earnings, you and Dan do a great earnings report show regularly. So I'm look forward to listening to that as well. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Tracy does have a mentor group listed <laughs> right now, depending on when you listen to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll probably I be sold out by then. Is that one or, uh, or uh, like I said, if, if you want to get more into, obviously, as we're discussing earnings, uh, Falco has good strategies as far as what he does personally to, to play it. So I, I think for new traders, having some kind of mentor group available, having somebody with experience do it. And I think it's not just with trading, it's with anything. If you're trying to get better at something, you're trying to get good at something, take the advice from somebody that's actually done it before and is currently doing it. Uh, it's it's easy for, especially when the market is all bullish that everybody is the best trader in the world. And you're, you, you get vi advice from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp, like just random friends that you meet that have been in it and maybe made some money when everybody else is making money. But when the market's tough and you have supply chain issues, you have inflation, you have companies with, with good earnings getting killed, companies with bad earnings getting killed, go to, go learn whether it's, it's one of us on the, on this, this uh, podcast or somebody else that, you know, has experienced trading. It doesn't even have to be real life trading, but I mean, obviously real life trading has, outstanding mentors and, and uh, just community in general. So what I would say is definitely find and attach yourself to to them, ask questions as much as you can. Uh, we're all pretty much here willing to help. So I would definitely, definitely suggest that uh, many people look at that, which could be found on www.reallifetrading.com. Falco, always a pleasure having you on. Uh, we got to get you back again much more frequently, but we'll get you for sure. Busy man. All right. Thank you both. <laughs> all right. Next Sounds time. Good.